I took five days for this trip. At first, I was going to explore the Blue Mountains. But since I had the opportunity to take five straight days off work, I decided I would put this to better use. The Blue Mountains are relatively close to Canberra, and I will have an opportunity to visit them this coming Christmas. I decided to use the five days to explore the Australian Alps instead. On my trip to the Great Ocean Road, I had stumbled upon the Great Alpine Road. Traversing this stretch of Serpentine Road had been so good that on the way back to Canberra, I decided to do it again. Now that I had five days to burn and a much better touring setup, I decided to explore some of the other roads stretching through the Alpine National Park and the Kosciuszko National Park. My plan at first was to camp at Jindabyne the first night, then ride down the Omeo Highway and spend the second night staying at my favourite caravan park at Omeo. Then I would turn around and head north over Mount Beauty, eventually winding my way back to Canberra. In my Great Ocean Road video, I got some amazing footage of riding over Mount Hotham at sunset, and I was lucky enough to be there when low-lying clouds were drifting across the peaks of the mountain, and I had the odd experience of passing through clouds as I rode the ridge of the mountain. I figured that the next door neighbour to Mount Hotham, which is a mountain called Mount Beauty, must be just as spectacular. After all, it can't have been named Mount Beauty for nothing. I took the Thursday and Friday off work. These were the two days before the October long weekend. This effectively gave me five straight days for which I could use to make the trip. During my first day at Jindabyne, I discovered several frustrating things. First, I visited the visitor centre at Jindabyne to buy a pass for the National Park and found out that the road between Cancoban and Threbo was closed for urgent repairs in anticipation for the traffic coming on the long weekend. This meant that instead of a simple drive of 100 kilometres from Threbo to Cancoban, a detour of several hundred kilometres would be necessary. This is the normal route to get to Cancoban, and this is the route that I would have to take. Going via the detour meant an extra 100 kilometers at least through mountain roads. This might not seem like much, but it's dangerous to go faster than 50 kilometers an hour most of the time on these roads, meaning that an extra 100 kilometers could mean another two hours or more of riding. The second thing I discovered was that the trout season didn't begin until Saturday morning, and until then it was illegal to fish for trout in the Alpine rivers. This was still two days away, so I had to put the kibosh on any plans I had to start fishing. I did, however, find a treasure in the gift shop at the visitor center. This small book, self-published, is called Secrets of Ghost Towns of the High Country, and basically it details history and information of towns in the Australian High Country which have been abandoned. I picked up this gem because, while traveling through the high country, I hoped I might be able to stop over at some of these locations and explore any ruins which might still be there. So, a bit deflated about the closed road, but also excited to explore some ghost towns, I made camp at a site called The Diggings in the Kosciuszko National Park. The mountains around the campsite were still dusted with snow on their peaks, even though it was about 25 degrees at the campsite. The river close by would have been perfect for trout, and I made a few sneaky casts even though trout season hadn't started yet. I sat down with my newly acquired guidebook to have a look and see which ghost towns or ruins I could visit on my way down to Omeo. The next day, I woke early in preparation for the long detour around the roadworks. The long detour route between Jindabyne and Cancoban strikes out towards Adaminibi and then curves around Lake Yukonbeen, finally traversing the mountains and passing through the Kosciuszko National Park. The high mountain road passes through Kabramurra, a town whose biggest claim to fame is that its altitude is the highest of any town in Australia. Snow still bordered the road and most of the shadows next to the buildings in Kabramurra. Cabramara is a town that was built to house the staff of the Snowy Mountain Hydroelectric Scheme. The last permanent Cabramara residents left in late 2018, with the town now populated by fly-in, fly-out staff. Other than a post office, cafe and bistro, there isn't much in the town, but I stopped for a coffee and enjoyed the snow, before heading down the mountains to Cancoban.
After leaving the mountain tops, I descended into the lower hills and finally burst out into the open valleys of the Upper Murray Shire. I might as well have ridden into Switzerland for all I knew. I don't think I've ever seen anywhere as green or as lush as the valleys I rode through on my way to Cancoven. Recent rain and warm weather must have sent the fields into overdrive because the paddocks were covered with knee-high emerald grass. I stopped at Cancoven for a coffee and the thought occurred to me I could just end my trip here, just camp and relax and enjoy the insanely verdant valley. I had places to be though. I hoped I could reach Omeo by nightfall, so I pushed on, heading to Koryong, which is the next significant town before the Omeo Highway. Koryong is one of my favorite stops, mainly because it has one of the best secondhand junk shops I've ever seen. The store is called Bakasha's Emporium and houses the most incredible mix of useless junk I've ever seen. This time when I stopped in, I found an amazing looking vintage leather motorcycle jacket, which was unfortunately slightly too small for me. But in the mix of tools, fishing rods, clothes, paperback books and furniture, it's always fun to rummage. If I lived closer and wasn't traveling on a motorcycle, I would surely have carted some jetsam home with me. The Omeo Highway is a long road cutting through the mountains down into Victoria's Alpine heart. Most of the Omeo Highway is windy roads on the sides of mountains. The mountain hulks above you on one side and on the other is a sheer drop down the side of the mountain. It's best to make sure you have a full tank of fuel before you set out because while there are points where you can refuel along the way, a lot of the petrol stations shut in the evenings and the road is long enough that you could run out of fuel along the way. It must have been 4.30 or 5 when I set off and by 6.30 or 7 I was halfway along the road and the light was retreating over the horizon fast. As I passed a camping ground called Lightning Creek, it started to rain. I didn't like the idea of riding mountain roads that steep in the twilight with the road slick from rain, so I stopped at Lightning Creek and quickly put up my tent as the rain started to come down harder. Lightning Creek is situated in a small valley between two mountains, and it takes a long time for the sun to rise enough to illuminate the valley. Fog and dew kept the, ma Fog and dew kept the valley damp long into the morning. The vegetation is thick and almost like a rainforest, with ferns and dense underbrush and tall expansive trees overhead. No doubt the vegetation is nourished by Snowy Creek, which passes through the valley. Lightning Creek is actually mentioned in Ghost Towns of the High Country. There used to be a town situated at Lightning Creek, but now the only remnants of houses are the stout brick fireplaces overgrown with underbrush. There are some walking tracks at Lightning Creek, but being wet and tired and cold, I decided not to explore these trails. Snowy Creek, which flows through the valley, seems like a good place for trout, but I decided not to dally on my way to Omeo. In the morning, when I woke up, my jacket and pants were still damp from the night before. Not only that, but the outside of my swag tent was as well, and I decided it was best to pack up ASAP and get to Omeo. The rest of the highway runs along the very literally named Big River, which flows down from Mount McKay. All along this river were fantastic camping spots, and the river looked amazing for fishing. By 10.30, I had reached Omeo, and the first stop I made was to a cafe called Twinkles, which, apart from being a really nice cafe, offers a reasonably priced breakfast. After riding damp and hungry for two hours, it was bliss to tuck into some bacon and eggs and a hot cup of coffee. I headed to the caravan park afterwards. Mercifully, the weather was clear and pleasantly warm, so I set up my tent to dry in the sun. So that'll do it for this video. In the next video, I'm going to talk about um, exploring the surroundings of Omeo and trying to find some of the ghost towns from the book that I bought. In the meantime, the rest of this video is just some of the footage from entering Omeo.